Hey, that's a good intro. <clears throat> this is the big guys. These are the fish. If you're throwing a fly rod, this is the holy grail of fishing on a fly rod. <clears throat> Let's get, get back to the uh, deal here. That was a number of record fish, the big ones that are at least on record. There's some bigger ones that didn't quite make all the uh, requirements for the record book, so I'm going to show you those here in a little bit. Let's see here. We'll get this thing blown back up. Oh. There it is. All right, but before we climb into tarpon, the last seminar that we did was on cobia. And just a week or two ago, we got out just off the beach headed towards, uh, from Destin towards Navarre, and on the way back, there's a big ray cruising along the outside edge of the first sandbar, and real close, and there was about a 30-pound cobia sitting right over the top of him. You couldn't see him at all except for a little bit of his dorsal fin. So we had a lot of talk and discussion about no cobia, but we actually ran up on one just a week or so ago, and that's that fish right there with uh, Captain Mark, and we landed the fish, and <clears throat> we actually went ahead and killed that fish, and we were looking for uh, particular parasites that occur in the gut that are specific to cobia. That fish also went to feed a lot of people in Mark's family. <laughs> so it was sacrifice, but with, with good reason and good intent. So there's still a few around. <clears throat> so I just want to welcome everyone uh, to the Saltwater Seminar Series. Uh, we couldn't do this without Legendary Marine, and we appreciate you guys hosting this for us. And I'm with Fly Tide 30A, and I've got Bill Walker here, uh, retired guide, fly fishing guide for many, many years here on the coast. And let's just jump right into it. I run a fly fishing school. I teach people how to cast, how to chase big fish like tarpon, and how to cast big rods like these 12 weights we've got up here. We'll demo a little bit here, show you how to throw these. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how to catch tarpon. We're gonna talk a little bit about the history of it here in Florida. We're gonna talk a little bit about the science of the fish itself, the natural history, and some of the unique aspects of the biology of this particular fish. We'll slip through these. If you're looking for a boat, that's the guys you need to see. <laughs> They're here in the audience. These guys don't know more than boats. They know fish as well. So you can talk to them about boats and you can talk to them about fishing. And you can talk to them specifically about getting the right boat for the kind of fishing you like to do. So they've got the expertise here at Legendary to, to fill you in. I don't want to leave out Ashley. Ashley's a, a driver and gets things done. She's not here tonight, she's taking care of children, but, but she is watching us live, and without, Ashley, thank you very much. This is, this is a person that makes it happen. All right, so we're gonna jump right into this. I had planned to show about 20 minutes of a film, but we're not gonna take the time to do that tonight, but if you get the chance, I want you to go online and look for this. It's produced by uh, the Fly Fishing Museum. It's called On Fly in the Salt. And there's about a 20 minute section in this video that will give you really the, uh, the history and all the unique aspects and how things have changed over time in, in terms of the, the uh, fly fishing uh, for tarpon, uh, primarily here in Florida, but, but elsewhere as well. It goes through the gear and how things have changed and how the actual sport has evolved over time. It's excellent. I highly recommend you take a look at it. And it's, there's a section in here, it's only about 20 minutes long. But if you get a chance, go ahead and take a look at it. It's the American Museum of Fly Fishing on Fly in the Salt. So here's a big one. This one didn't make the record books. Um, 
Although the International Tarpon Conservation Association kind of documented this one. It was caught off the coast of Africa and the estimated weight on this fish was 326 pounds. I think this is, Bo, unless you know otherwise, I think this is the biggest fish, at least with an estimate, for tarpon. And this is an all tackle, this is not fly. Yeah, yep, yep. <laughs> is this showing both slides or is it just showing the one yeah yeah it, it, right. uh, here's the next one this is a recent one it was actually they caught a lot of film on this one it was one of the fishing shows and uh, this one was estimated at 312 pounds and this one we have a fork length and a girth on this one. And this was caught off the coast of Columbia. And uh, this one probably would have made the record books except there were multiple, the, the guy that hooked it already had some pre-existing problems, shoulder in, in, uh, injury, I think. So you get more than one person landing one fish, then that's, uh, that doesn't make the record book. That's, that disqualifies you. But this is a huge fish here. So if we actually get into the record books and we look at what we've got on the books, the IGFA All Tackle World Record is 286 pounds and nine ounces. And again, caught off, caught off the coast of Africa. For some reason, the bigger fish seem to be hanging right off the coast of Africa. Um, you wanna talk about that a little bit, Bo? You got any insight on those? I, I, I don't, I, what I, you know, the, we're learning so much more about the migrational patterns of these fish these days. For me, for me to try to give you an opinion of why these fish end up off the tip of Africa, it, it would be a simpleton's opinion from, you know, what, what we thought. So a, a, the popular consensus, if you would have asked us 15 years ago, would have been that was the end of the migration. So the, the fish had gotten as large as it, it could get. But since then, we've learned the same thing about tarpon that we've learned about ducks. You know, a duck can fly from Arkansas to Louisiana and back in three days. So we're, we don't have the same, you know, the misconceptions aren't there about these fish. So speaking about it, it, it has to have something to do with the habitat there and their growth patterns at, at, what, at what is the last third of their life. So the IGFA tippet class world record, and that this is on fly rod, in the tw it's, in the, it's not always the largest fish on the heaviest tippet, right? But in this case it is. So the line class is 20 pound tippet, and it's 202 pounds, eight ounces, and this was caught back in 2001 by James Holland in Chazahuitza, Florida. So the, the world record for a, a fish on fly rod is right here in, in Florida. And some of the bigger fish, the biggest fish ever caught on fly um, anywhere have all been in that area, in the Homosassa area in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And uh, there's a lot of history there. There are a lot, of, a lot of guys that went up and got on those fish and that Fishery kind of dwindled over the years. So there were, you know, issues with maybe freshwater sources coming in through springs and providing an estuarine habitat for blue crabs and the, the larger tarpon were coming in and gorging themselves on blue crabs. And then with development and a lack of flow of freshwater, the idea was that diminished the crab population and then maybe not so many fish. But in recent days, so, that population seems to be rebounding. And um, you want to talk about that a little bit? <laughs> it's the same fish. I don't disagree with what you're saying, but I can't prove you right either. <laughs> here's, here's what I will say. We, we, and, and again, now that we're tagging and tracking fish, you know, I mean, again, think about what I just said. You know, we used to think we understood the, the duck migration in a manner where it came through Louisiana, went up through Arkansas and made its flyway path. And since we've started tracking ducks, we found out that they can fly from Arkansas back to the, to the marsh in Louisiana and back to Arkansas in 72 hours. So we, we don't understand these patterns the way we thought we did. 
So these fish, these fish are circling. They're coming back through these bays twice, three times, even as migrators. And, and, and we're learning now more than ever the things they're, they're you know when i started tarpon fishing we we just knew them when we saw them i mean you know nobody was tracking anything you know you knew you knew when you went out at daybreak and you saw them breathe well what we're doing now with the with with what we're tracking as far as the the mating and the migrating seasons is it, john is far more qualified to speak about but i keep learning every day how narrow my viewpoint was on this And 73 degrees was the magic number. Yeah. No, no. I mean, you know, I mean, I used to watch. We used to watch the water temperature and the moon. That was those were those were it. But I, I, I. I, I have to respectfully disagree. I, 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 and, and I'm not going to speak about other guys' production. Right. I'm, I'm going to respectfully here. No, but you 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 turn the clock a little to the to the east, and and there there are there are trophy fish that swim past here. They have to because they're because they're migrating. So do you think it's a function of I, I think it has to do with the Menhaden, the Puggy source, and an awful lot of other things that happen. Um, but I'm going to tell you that I think a lot of, unlike Homosassa, and I'm speaking completely opinion-based, I believe Homosassa has enough of a bait source where it creates some fish that get really big. I will tell you I think there are more migrating big fish here. They're just so, they're so spread out. The odds... You know, you 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 you're fishing the wide end of the funnel. Do you get what I mean? So you you've got all these fish that are migrating through that we all see, and we all have trouble feeding, right? You know, I mean, unless you're going to live bait them. So I mean, if you're <laughs> if you're if you're a purist or a fly fisherman, and that's what I am, and that's the point of view I speak from, you know, you can you know, if you want to go tarpon watching, man, I'm your guy. You get me some really clear water, and we can go watch tarpon all day long. Can we get them to eat? Odds are really slim. I just feel like we see all the fish, like that melanistic fish that Pat caught in Destin a few years ago. I know three people that saw that. Dude, I see I see a fish in Appalachia. I saw a fish. I don't see him anymore, her, um, anymore. But, I mean, for three seasons, we had a fish called Patches that had a, that had a big spot right here of discoloration. Right. Same fish every year. Same place and within, and within several days of it. Th so, that's a migrating fish. Yeah, so... The, the latter half of the presentation, we're going to give you a lot of data yeah. on fish migration and spawning. And there's been some awesome research that's been done that's actually going to kind of get into this a little deeper as well. I'm glad he brought this picture up because he mentioned something y'all ought to all watch. And if you can find it, the original Tarpon video from the early 70s that had Tom McGuane, had Jim Henson, and had Guy Valdi, who I have had the honor as a young fishing guide to fish for about seven years are these are the guys that with fiberglass rods and literally the first maverick boat ever that popped out of a hole and they're pulling from the bow yeah as you can see in this because nobody had a pulling plant <laughs> nobody had invented it yet yeah and that came out of homosassa as a gentleman that was guiding it out of homosassa and invented the pulling platform yep. So I don't know why that's there. Oh, this thing jumped ahead. But if you can, and it's hard to find, but it was made, I want to say in 74, 75. I mean, and these guys are, they're, they're real tarpon fishermen. You know, they're, they're the same kind of junkies we are today, but they're the, they're the in-station moment of it. Yep. So how do you catch one of these 200 pound beasts, you know, or upwards of 300 pounds that are out there? The rod itself, let's, let's get you this rod I'm out of your chair maybe for a minute. Sure. We're going to talk about equipment and what it takes. The first thing was that, we'll go back to that boat, that's the old, uh, moved ahead. So this rod, typically 11, 12 weight, fly rod is what you're using, 
to uh, the fish for tarpon. Some guys are actually dropping it down even down to a 10 for a smaller tarpon. What do you think about using a 10 weight? I, you know, I love casting them. I hate fighting fish with them. Right. And, so. I, and I don't like to fight <laughs> fish for very long. You know, they, you know, these are one of those fish that truly are, you know, when I say our friends, it, it's, a, it's an interaction. There's nothing about this that is going to be a, a food producing source. So you need to match yourself with what you think is the highest interaction with the fish that you enjoy. And it does the least amount of damage to the fish during that time. I mean, these are, you, you need, and I've always called them this, these are, these are, these are mythical animals or dinosaurs, treat them as such. You know, don't, don't monkey around with them, don't lift their heads, don't, don't, just don't be that guy, man. This, this fish is special. It's sort of like a permit. Yeah. You know, they're, they're truly special animals. They've been around for over 100 million years, and the faster, the harder you work them, and the faster you can get them in, the better chance you've got at releasing that fish in a way that's not going to harm it, or a predator like a hammerhead or a bull shark's not going to come along and take a big chunk out of it. So I prefer fishing a 12 weight. If you're casting correctly, it's not a big heavy stick. You can cast it, you can blind cast it all day long. If you're moving correctly with a 12 weight, it doesn't matter. You can do it all day long and it's never going to hurt your arm or your hands. Um, so the pop, uh, I won't go through those, but there's a number of brands and makes out there. They're all good, and they range in price from over $1,000 to just a couple of hundred bucks, and they're all, all, all sufficient to get the job done. Reels, you want a nice big large arbor reel, got plenty of room for backing. Um, you got good brakes on it, that one there, that Mako reel. The T-bore, I know uh, Bo likes to use T-bore, so do I. Uh, other reels made in Florida, uh, Nautilus, uh, and, and then there's up in Colorado, Abel makes good reels. But you, make, but you want one that's got a big arbor, it holds lots of backing. That way when he runs, you're going to be able to keep up with him and you want good brakes on it so that you can work him good and hard to get him in as quickly as you can. Comments on reels or rods? It, when you're, with your tarpon reel, it's one of the few places, drop some dough, man. I mean, I'll tell you, trout and redfish reels, they're line holders. You know I mean? Do I fish T-bores? Sure. But it's because I, I love them. This is the spot where if you're going to put together a setup, put something that has some reel drag, because this is where a reel will, it's going to fail. If it's going to fail anywhere. I mean, a redfish is going to have a really hard time pulling the guts out of anything but the cheapest reel. Here, that first run is reel. And, and the, way that, the way that a reel transfers energy in that first run, Cheap reels are going to bounce. They're going to break you off. So this, this, if you're going to, if you're going to have a bag full of reels and you're going to spend money in one spot and you're serious, do it in your biggest reel because it's the biggest impact. You know, it's the largest piece of cork, it's the largest exposure, and you know, you're trying to stop a freight train <laughs> with a with a buggy whip. <laughs> Fly line, <clears throat> 11, 12 weight. Uh, it's different situations for different kinds of fly line, whether you're using a full float or you're using intermediate or you got a sink tip. It just depends on water clarity and what's going on with the fish, how they're behaving. Um, having another spool where you can change things out pretty quickly. I think most people throw floating, but I tend to throw sink tips or trying to get it down just below the surface. And uh, Bo, what's your thoughts on that? You know, I, I, I leave with everything. I, I tend to fish when the fishing's good. I tend to fish whatever's on the reel. And normally I start with a floating line. The, the biggest reason for that is most of the days I'm fishing, I'm fishing while the fish are migrating. And it's so critical to, to make that transition. And I think we talked about this last time. You know, the transition between casting and stripping that moment between when you send it and when you're ready to fish, that's the place to trim time. If there's anything I can tell you to do better, it's not to cast further, it's to go from doing this to doing this as fast as you can. That's, 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 that's the moment that makes or breaks most fish. Yeah, keeping the slack out of the line after you del deliver the fly, the faster you can make sure you don't, you've got as little slack as possible when it eats. 
And we're fishing this fish so much closer than we used to because we have so much more technology. I mean, when we were running push poles, you know, you had to have an 80 foot cast. You know, now they're talking, you know, we talk about the slap and slide, you know, the, that thing that happens right here. Well, I mean, when you make an 80 foot cast and you sit there and get to admire it, you got all the time in the world. When you do the slap and slide, you need to be, you need to be fishing when that hits the water. Because I mean, you, you've located who you're fishing, you're, you're presenting, and if, and if it's sitting still, then the predator alive that's used to a bait sitting still. Okay. So <clears throat> then we go from fly line to leader. If you're fishing IGFA and you want to be legal, and most of the guides down in the Keys and elsewhere, you know, there's, there's two trains of thought. You either want to get out there and you want to catch fish, and it doesn't matter, or if you're chasing record fish or you're tournament fishing, you pretty much want to be IGFA legal. And there's a certain way that you have to build that leader to meet the requirements. When it comes to the fly line, you can use any type of fly line and backing. It doesn't matter. The material doesn't matter. The butt section, there's no limit on the length and material strength. Typically, a butt section is about six feet of 50 pounds, but it, it can vary. Bo, what do you like to use? You know, it, it, the, we had this discussion in the car over here today, and I have a... I have, I have a couple of good friends that really are addicts for setting records and always being set up for a record. And if that's your jam, then you need to train yourself to do so. I, I really like to see fish jump. I really like, I really like to interact with them. And, and I don't think that I'm as driven by a record anymore. So I, you know, I use my arm three times and whatever my leader is, that's what it is. And I tie the fly on. I'm not recommending this style. I'm telling you what I do as, as a 30 year fly fisher. I, I will say being set up for a record is the only way you're ever going to get one. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm never going to set a record doing what I do. I'm never going to get lucky. I'm never going to run across one. So, you know, choose, choose, choose what you think your, your drive is. And then if you're going to set records and tie really good knots, get, get, go all the way down the rabbit hole learn how to tie bevity twists and huffing eagles and, and, and everything you need and make sure to measure every leader. Because I can tell you, not from personal experience, but from a very close friend experience, a quarter of an inch makes a difference to the IGFA. Yeah, it's, it's pretty strict. Actually a 16th of an inch, a 32nd of an inch. Well, so butt section, six foot, the material strength doesn't really matter. That first taper, typically you're doing an approved blood knot to a 40 pound, it's another five or six feet, doesn't really matter. But when you get to the class tippet that it connects to that, that's where the IGFA gets real strict. It has to be a minimum of 15 inches long, non-metallic, and it's got to attach directly to the fly or the shock tippet. 20 pound or less for IGFA, and usually it's an improved blood knot at that spot as well, although other, you, there's a number of knots you can use. But here the regulation is it has to be at least 15 inches or greater. John, I, I don't know anymore, but what's, what's the maximum chafe leader you're allowed in fly fishing these days? The chafe leader? Yeah. You're talking about the shock? Yeah, the, the, the very end. The very end, yeah. yeah. So they call it the shock or the bite tippet or chafe. That has to be less than 12 inches. Yeah, see that's Jay. When I it was fifteen and fifteen for many many years. Yeah, it was over fifteen yeah. on the line class, under fifteen on the on the chain. And you can go to the IGFA website, and it'll show you exactly how to build the leader out and what all the requirements are. Um, but then when you go to the shock or the bite tippet to the fly itself, there's a number of different knots you can make. But Bo and I were talking about this as well on the way over. You know that once that fly's hooked inside the mouth. That knot is not really all that critical as long as it's a good tight knot. You're not worrying about it getting chafed so much. That's not, it's not so much a critical point as long as you've tied a good knot. And Bo and I both tie something very similar. I tie a Steve Huff double figure eight. It's real easy to tie. It's just two, double, it's just two figure eights that butt up against one another when you pull from either end. A lot of people use to improve Homer Rhodes, and I think uh, Bo's tying something similar to improve hey, Homer Rhodes. I, I tie an overhand, run it through the hook eye, back through that 
overhand and then I tie another overhand right behind it and I just make sure to put enough pressure on it that I know that it's not the weakest point in my tippet. So when when I think of a when I think of a tarpon tippet, and, and let's let's suppose for the moment that we're talking about line class tippets. That's not gonna be your failure point. So so don't don't spend your whole life making a big knot next to the fly that the fish is gonna see. Make something really small and make sure you tighten it really well and it seats really well, but it's gonna break somewhere up the line unless it chafes through. And if it's gonna chase through, the knot at the end isn't isn't the failure point. So, you know, pick a knot that you like. I, I don't like tarpon flies that, that aren't on a loop because I think when you stop right in front of his face and let it sink, it gives it just a little more wiggle if you're off on your cast. And yes, I'm, I'm saying that this, this is the difference between a bite and not a bite. And so if, you, if you're ahead or behind and it's on a, it's on a piece of 30, 40, 50, Steve it's gonna sink down on a loop. directly. If it's on a loop, it you know a little current, a little wiggle might it, might get that instinctual bite, and and that's the way you got to hedge your bets, guys. You know, I mean, all those all those things are part of the part of the part of this massive lucky equation that equals a, a bite. And then we start talking about jumps and boating and all that later. <laughs> <laughs> so we're passing around a fly right now that's got a Steve Huff double figure eight with a stationary loop on it, and just give you an idea of what it looks like. And it's a, that particular fly is a, considered a toad and kind of an olive, uh, more crab-like color pattern. Although black and purple, that's, that's the big, uh, those are the colors of choice, it seems to be these days. It works really well, both in darking, uh, lighter, uh, more transparent water. And there's a number of different flies out there. The, the one thing I, I, I really like to share, and I'm going to love to hear your thoughts on it, Bo, is, you know, there's the classic fly pattern that you'll see in print and had been used for years and years. And you don't see it used anymore because the, the tarpon recognize it. And now you get down the keys, the guys down there will even tell you, you'll have a younger fish moving towards that fly, and there'll be an older fish that'll come in and knock that fish off that fly because it knows that, he knows what it is. So the flies and the patterns and the hooks have been getting smaller and smaller and the leaders have been getting longer and longer. These fish are getting smarter and one reason is they're pack animals, they herd. And we don't gaff them and kill them anymore. We turn them loose, it's a federal law. You have to turn these fish loose in the best shape you possibly can. They, and they learn. So you'll have a lead animal out front, usually a big female, and um, they're recognizing fly patterns. So, look, any, I, I, any comments? You're talking about, about a cockroach, and I- it, That's it, it, one of them. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so I, I will agree that the, 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 the patterns that we fished for years on long hook shanks where the flies, where the meat of the fly was half to two thirds of the way back on the hook shank are gone. Um, we nicely enough have circle hooks now for those who, who can't not trout set. And I know that sounds different, but believe it or not, with a fly rod, that second difference is where they close their mouth and the trout set helps. Um, I, I, agree, I agree with exactly what they said. The fish are getting smarter and smarter. But I've also been using the same pattern of fly 99% of the time for seven years. So, so it, it, and that hurts my feelings because I don't want to have to go to another fly in this lifetime. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I have boxes full of, 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 of cockroaches that were tied by really great fly tires that we occasionally take out of the box, but not very often. And we, even the color patterns have changed. Well, you're having more success with those in cloudier, darker water? I, I have more success in cloudier, darker water, period. Yeah. The, the, so, I mean, and, and, and John and I had this discussion on the way over. I, 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 I believe that being a tarpon fisherman is a lifelong journey, and if you're not willing to go on it, then, then, then accept this talk and move on to something easier. If you are, then you're gonna spend a lot of your time chasing these fish to become good at it. But one of the, one of the things that I will tell you is you are going to be attracted to very clear water you are in the wrong place. 
So the clearer the water gets, you need to get less comfortable. You know, that place where you can see them freight training all the way down the beach like we've all seen. Somebody raise their hand who's had one of those eat. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to say, I mean, I'm just demonstrating. I haven't either. <laughs> you know, somebody, somebody tell me a story about having eight jumps out of a, out of a string of 100 fish that were in gin clear water look like Cosmoleta. Yeah, man. So when, when, when your eyes tell you that everything is right, it ain't, man. Track them, clock them, think about them, cast to them, try, always. But, but don't get comfortable in clear water. That's my only piece of advice. <laughs> well, let's do this. Thumbs up or thumbs down. White lightning. Well, toad. Let's start with the toad. You like toads? In certain situations. All right. White lightning? I don't use any true feathers in tarpon fishing anymore. All right. That rules out sand devil. Andy shrimp? I know you like black and purple. Good please see. Well, yeah. Um, I, the, the first three, the answer to the first one is, sure, if you tie it in exactly the right pattern for the exact right tide at the exact right day at the exact right spot. All right. Um, the next three I haven't thrown in a decade or better. Um, the, the, the EP Puglisi is a, is, a, is a variation of the pattern I fish a lot of the time. Um, the the Piola worm, I don't live in the Keys. So I, I haven't fished it since I caught the worm run when I was 28. And that's the only year I ever caught it truly. And it, and it is the sickest thing you've ever seen. Dragon tail? Um, the dragon tail, if you have an angler who knows how to use it and can get it far enough in front of the fish to put it in the bite area. And that's the hardest thing with that fly is I, I think the fly is a bitey fly. I just think it's, like I said, those it's a really hard fly to get to work in that, in that cast. And as we become better tarpon fishermen, these fish become closer to the boat. So when you talk about a fish that has that much length, mass, and castability, its setup is, is longer. So when you're looking at flies, especially if you've caught fish and you've got fish and you've got fish next to your boat that you can really fish, if you have them, make sure you have a, a fly that's going to get down there. And the other tip I'm going to give tonight, and then I truly am going to be done. <laughs> carry, carry some lead on your boat. Some carry some lead wire. Be able to change the depth for all fish. Be able to change the depth of your fly. Just the fly. You know whether it's one wrap of lead line to to drop it six inches, or whether it's four to drop it fourteen. It. Don't forget that the fly may not be the issue. It may be where it's placed in his bite pattern. So don't, you know, if you've had a fish look at a fly and you're like, well, I'm changing flies because he didn't eat it. Don't, don't immediately go to the fact that he didn't like the pattern. You know, just, just remember, we're normally the problem. <laughs> Actually, we're always the problem. You know what I mean? The, the fly is either in the wrong spot or being pulled the wrong way or it's in the wrong depth. <clears> right, you know what I mean? So, so at the end of the day, you know, if you have a fish that's interested in a pattern, don't give up just because you're fishing it the way it came out of the box. Write that one down. I'm surprised he told you that too. And and and, I, and 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 if and if anybody I know is watching this, I'll probably have to answer for it tomorrow. Oh yeah, you will for that I, one. I, I will. I will. I, I will. I will. No question. Get a text before I get home. Yep, uh, that's some but, inside you know, info there. But again, that's that that goes for all fish. When I say this about tarpon, I mean this about redfish, tarpon, false albacore, I don't care what you're fishing for. You know, I mean, fish that are doing things on the surface may not be eating flies an inch and eighth. You know, they're eating live baits. So remember, if you're gonna trick him, you gotta trick him right. And, and it's, a, it's, it's a good rule for anything. If you, you know, if you have a redfish that follows all the way to the boat, analyze the depth, analyze where your fly was in that depth, and analyze whether, whether or not the fish had the opportunity to truly eat. You know, don't don't immediately go. I can't believe you didn't eat that. I can always believe you didn't eat it. That's that's why I'm a decent fisherman. Every time every time I get turned down, my first question is, what did I do wrong? Not how did he not eat that. All right. So 
So you're not going to catch them from the beach, not that often. You need to get in the boat. And this is the way they used to do it. It's Tom McGuane down there back in the 70s in the Keys. They're pushing, pull, push pulling off the bow of the boat. These guys, these fish weren't spooky. They weren't picky. They'd eat just about anything they threw at them. Uh, fiberglass rods with, you know, with spay rod rails from Alaska. But skiffs have evolved, boats have evolved. You can look around here and you can see exactly how boats are evolving. But here's one, this is probably late 70s, early 80s style. We've got a casting platform now on the back end of the boat. Guides down in the water. His client's up there on the bow. He's even got a place there to hang on and lean up against it if he's fighting a fish or if it's a little rocky. And today, this is pretty much what it looks like. If you're fishing off a skinny water skiff, you're getting up in the shallow water, you're getting inside. This is kind of a Florida Keys version here. And you can see Flip Pallet, one of the originals, one of the greats actually throwing a really tight loop here. And you can see just how relaxed he is. There's no muscle in it. It's just the way he moves with the rod and the way he makes that line move. So you got to have the right boat in the right situation and the right equipment. You got to know what's going on with the fish and with the tide and the environment. You need to know what they're feeding on and how they're feeding or if they're feeding at all. So there's a lot of variables involved in trying to not just locate the fish, but to get the fish to pay attention to that fly. All right, so we got the right equipment, we're on the right boat, and you can come here and get a good boat. I know you can, go, you can get skinny water skips here as well as large boats for getting offshore, but once you get a fly to that fish, Bo, take them through it, because this, this, there's more, this is probably where there's as much art involved in fly casting as anywhere, or in fly fishing as there is anywhere else, because it's not just taking a lure and tossing it out there and the fish just runs and hits it. There's an art to this, and there's a lot, so many different variables, and your hand is not just on the rod, your hand's on that line, and you're making that fly behave in a manner that's going to fool that fish. And there's a lot that goes into to learning that and, and understanding not just how to present the fly like in, say, freshwater trout fishing, but how to actually work that fly. So, so oh. you know, given, given, given the, your ability to both clock these fish and then what I mean is figure out what they're going to do, figure out which direction they're going to be coming from, you've, you've, you've done a lot of work now, right? and we're getting ready to do the end of it, which is try to get that fish to eat a fly. So this is where I don't mind talking much because you've done the work. Um, and, and I will tell you, I almost exclusively these days fish with the rod under my arm. That has some to do with the fact that I've, I'm not in as good a shape as I used to be with my legs, but I have figured out that dealing with a fish this way is better than dealing with him this way. I there, it, and listen, we we can talk about Rob Fordyce, we can talk about Flip Pallet, we can talk about Andy Mill, we can talk about David Mangum, we can talk about what everybody wants in a strip. The right strip makes a fishy. Okay, so my right strip for a fish tends to tends to be something that I do like this, and it just works for me. That's it. I if I do this. If I tick, if I if I do anything at the end of the cast, anything that's not smooth and and then what I think of as as a presentation brought back elegantly, and I know that's kind of a weird way to say this, I don't I just don't get as many bites. So and when we talk about a group of fish, right, you know, so say they're coming through here. Unlike any other fishing where the fly lands and how quickly you move it and what gets seen by it during that time frame and tarpon fishing grows exponentially. So, you know, you may make a cast to a group of redfish, right? Just cast in the middle. That very rarely happens with tarpon fishing. No, you know, no guide's ever going to go, just cast in the middle of them. 
You know, they're going to give you a clock. They're going to tell you how far they want it. They're going to tell you to stop it. They're going to tell you when to strip, how to strip, what they want, small, small, stop, stop, hold, hold. And, you know, it's bring it, baby, baby, baby. You know I mean? It's, there's a very finesse and, and it takes forever to learn. So, I mean, what, 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 we're, what we're having a conversation about here is the mezzanine area of saltwater fly fishing. So if you think making a cast in front of a bunch of training fish and snatching a hook through them like you, like you might could do with, you know, jackarvales, false albacore, any of those fish we all learn to fight fish on, this ain't it, man. It is a game of, of inches and, and cadence and placement. So, I mean, when we, talk about, when we talk about the area it needs to hit, it needs to be about, about that big, and you need to pull it at exactly the right time. He needs to see it and engage with it, and 60% of the time he's still going to tell you no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, because this isn't a bait fish. <laughs> this isn't what he eats. So, you know, I mean, what, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make a cast that lands so quickly and his instincts take over before his head can tell him no. Because these fish are smarter than, than, than a fly is. Don't, you know, you, you could dangle this underneath the lights all night long. He's never going to bite, right? So this has to be something that he catches visually and makes an instinctual decision to do something over. And to get that to happen is one of the hardest things in fly fishing. I wish you all the greatest of luck because when it happens, <laughs> it, I mean, it still shakes me down to my feet. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, the, it's the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. Still but is. One of the things I've learned is when you're single-handed stripping, what happens is there's a pause. Each time you move it, there's a stop, and you're going to reach and strip again. And each time you pause, you get a bounce, right? Yep, so you're getting this bounce. You get a pause, and then you get a bounce. And they don't like it at all. So if you can do two hands, you can regulate the speed, you can take the bounce and the twitches out of it. It's more of a smooth motion that they're much more comfortable with. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. It, it, well, I mean, it, there's nothing worse. Yeah. And again, it, it, you know what he was saying, one-handed strip. Your strip, strip, he eats it, spits it out, and you're, and you're caught in the middle of a strip. Which is, which is why, you know, I went to doing this because, you know, I'm sitting there doing this and I can watch him eat. And when he does, I'm like, whoa! Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and, and I hope we all understand that, you know, you, you do understand with these fish, if you lift the rod tip, you're done. I mean, trout setting, will, you will never catch a tarpon doing this when he eats. If you do, it's up. And, mm -hmm. and if you fish with the guys I fish with, you will spend most of the day buying drinks and listening to your, having your rear end shoot off. <laughs> so, yeah, and Bo, for people that are watching this online that have never tarpon fish, show, show them the proper strip set again. It, 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 for me, these days, and again, I'm, I'm not as mobile as I used to be due to, due, to, due to some ancillary items that I have. But when I make the cast, you know, and, and I did it this year, and this is, this is actually about where we're at. It's strip, 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 and when he eats it, just, and hold. If you missed him, go back to what you were doing and try to take up line, or pick up and go right back after him, because if you missed him. But if you're doing this, and he catches you between when he closes your mouth, you're, you're trying to do this. And then what happens is, even if he eats it, you're here, you're trying to get tight, and, and you're in trouble. I, I will tell you that my production stripping underneath my arm and being and being smoother with what I do so that when it happens, it happens immediately changes a lot, you know, going and, and making that transition. I can't, there's, you know, I said it the first time I'll say it every time I'm invited, making the transition from here to here, the moment between when you send it and when you strip it, as the game gets closer to the boat, that is the game changer. Because if that fly floats down past his face, if it's not moving, you're done. You, you, you know, the fish behind it's done. You know, if there's, if there's a big gap, you've got three fish behind that maybe, but nah. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's a much harder thing to manage close up. 
and again, like he, he just mentioned, what we're trying to do is we're trying to trick them in a timeline that is super, super tight because these fish have giant eyes. They're, you know, they've been on the planet for way longer than we have, and, and it ain't easy. So, you know, you got to give them the credit they deserve. You know, I may not tie GFA leaders anymore, but, but I spend a lot of time watching fish bite, and I spend a lot of time with the way they react to casts. The problem is I spend a lot of time watching the way they react to bad casts, but, but that's, you know, but you learn as much from that as you do good ones. They're just not near as much fun. <laughs> and of course, you've got to have a good cast. You've got to be able to double haul if, if for distance. Not all the all cast at tarpon are going to be at distance, like Bo mentioned. A lot of them are going to be up pretty darn close. But being able to master the cast and throw in the wind and keep the slack out, you know, it's really important to have a, a good cast and not to have to think about it. It's got you've got to be as instinctive as the fish is when you go to, to put that fly where it needs to be. We'll get past that. So we want once you once you hook one. You know, there's some best practices that I think we should all employ to take care of these fish. And they, they are, um, due to habitat loss and other reasons, you know, the, the population, at least worldwide, is really ha has been impacted. There just aren't as many fish around. There's certainly not as many big fish around as there used to be. So you know, the first thing you want to do is, and there's, there's kind of rules of the road, road for both you know, fly fishing or, or using bait as well. If you're using bait, you know, use a circle hook. That way they're not gonna swallow a J hook going down into its throat, you know, or getting down to its stomach for the most part. Um, you get something that's cut deep, you know, you can cut it loose. Um, over time, that, that, that hook's gonna rot out. You know, it's better to cut it loose than to try and stick your hand down the throat of that fish and injure the fish. Um, we mentioned it earlier, the fight time. You want to fight him hard, you don't, need, you don't, don't worry about losing him. You hook him, and that's one thing most guys do, right? They hook that first one. Last thing they want to do is they don't want to lose him, and they're going to play him real soft. That's the last thing you want to do. You want to play him hard. You want to work him. You want to get him to the boat quick, you know, and, and turn him loose unharmed. As soon as he gets hooked, there's a shark anywhere in the area. He's coming for a free meal. And he's going to make quick work. Hammerheads love them. Bull sharks love them. They'll tear them up in a heartbeat if they're on a line. And even after you, if you wear them out, you've worked them too long, you know, and you get a successful release, but that fish is worn out. And there's a hammerhead just sitting there lurking, waiting, you know. And he's going to nail him regardless, even when he's off the hook. If you don't work him hard and work him quick and get him turned loose. I have, um, I have done things that I'll never admit other than hitting hammerheads with the push pole, but watching the way predators come after beaten tarpon that have been on the line for more than 30 minutes. If, if you're, if you're going to, if you're going to dedicate yourself to fighting him that long and, and I really think you should stop short of that, then you should steward that fish after you've released it. And what I mean by that is you need to stay in your boat. You need to put your boat between him and the sharks. You, sorry, man, these, these, these are majestic. These are dinosaurs. They, the reason we are having such a great renaissance is because the way we're managing this fishery. Be an asset. And the other thing is you got one hooked, you got him to the boat, try and keep his mouth at least partially in the water. Keep that water getting over, over his gills. You know, last thing you want to do is after you've fought him and you've worn him out, then the last thing you want to do is starve him for oxygen and to have his own weight out of the water hurting him because you physically got him out of the water and his own weight is causing a problem for him. So just, you know, treat the, the fish with respect and get him turned loose as quickly as you can. So. There's, we have state and there are federal regulations, you know, minimum size limit, there isn't one. You can catch whatever size tarpon you can find. The tarpon over 40, 40 inches have to stay in the water. I recommend you keep them all in the water. Don't, don't pull them out. You can get a good picture next to a tarpon right next to the boat. You don't have to pull him out of the water. Have your buddy and, take pictures of the jump. That's the cool stuff anyway. 
Yeah. You know, fish with people who are cool enough to video the cool part. The first, the first seven minutes of this are going to be the most exciting part of the entire fight. Get the pictures of the eat, the first three jumps. You know, it, these pictures of fish that are given up next to the boat to make one whale and then come up and, you know, belly up. You know, you know it, that, that's not going to, you're going to show that and what, here's how you're going to explain it. You really should have seen it when it started. Fish with somebody who's willing to run the camera when it starts. You know, I mean, find a good fishing partner. I mean, what, with, with this fishery, the cool part is showing people jumps, releases, the things, the things that make this epic. And what doesn't make it epic is a beaten fish. I mean, imagine fighting 12 rounds and then asking somebody to hold your breath, hold their breath for a minute while somebody took a photo. You can't do that. Don't ask him to do it. Yep. Well, and part of the rules, you can uh, pay for a tarpon tag. And if it's a, a tarpon that you catch that uh, is somewhere near the world record, and you can use an onboard calculator. You just, there's some measure, quick measurements you can make. And if you think it's anywhere near a world record and you've prepaid for a tag, you can take the fish. But I'm going to throw in, I, I try not to throw in my own personal opinions on a lot of this stuff, but I'm going to throw it in on this one. I will too. Yeah, don't gaff them. Take the measurements, be happy with the measurements you're going to get and, and an estimate of the weight. I think killing these fish, especially the bigger ones that play such a vital role in reproduction and you know the the and sustaining the species as a whole, it's just more important than you know uh, getting your name in a record book. Get a picture, take some quick measurements, be good with it. Don't gaff it, don't kill him, don't bring him back. But you are legally allowed to do it if you've got a tarpon tag and it's a fish that has a potential world record. You, you, also, if, if, if you apply for one of these tags, and I understand it's legal, be, be, very, be very aware of how taboo this is inside the fishery. So, I mean, if, if you do understand if you, if you back a boat, if you, if you put a boat on a trailer at any dock I know of with a dead fish in it, you better be leaving the state with it. <laughs> like, and I mean right then. Checked out of your hotel, your bag in the car. You need to make sure they don't get your tag number, and you need to leave the state of Florida. And and I and I say that, and I'm proud of it. The reason this fishery is where it is is because we protected them the way we have. And and it's it. Try it anywhere east of here, and I can tell you, like I said, you better be you better be crossing the state line in the next 90 minutes. Because <laughs> there are guys who just they like me these these fish are are something that took us an entire lifetime to even start to grasp and the respect we have for them and 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 the fact that they have no food value just there's just no tolerance for them. so here's the tarpon tag specifications it's actually florida rule it's a federal rule as well but here's the one for florida and um uh, it gives you all the ins and outs for applying for and getting a permit. Um, and then here are the calculators. There's an online calculator through Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. Um, or you can use the graph, old school down there on the bottom right. Um, but you can just plug in uh, the girth and you can see uh, on the fish here where it shows right at the dorsal fin right here where you can measure around the girth here and then you measure the fork length from the jaw back to the fork and the tail and then you just plug that in and it's going to give you an estimate of the weight of that fish. So much better than killing it. Here's our first official commercial break. <laughs> we want you to look around at the boats. These guys are having us here uh, graciously to do this and to provide the information to you and if you're looking for a boat or you need one. These guys are all here that can help you out and Legendary has dealerships both here in Panama City Beach as well as Destin and other places. So, um, and like I said previously, these guys also know a lot about fishing as well. It's not just about boats. So we're going to get into the science a little bit on these fish. <clears throat> and in the last presentation, it kind of surprised me when we were talking about cobia. 
We had a number of people in the audience that I thought, well, we're going to talk a little science and I'm going to lose people. But that ended up being a pretty interesting part, I think, for a lot of people that attended the last session. So I think we've got just as much information here, and it's going to, I think it's interesting and unique. And some of it's recent data that's just been published. So we're, we're learning a lot more about tarpon, and um, it'll help to manage the species and to, and to protect it. The first thing here, uh, tarpon, the genus species for the one that we fish here in Florida and up the Atlantic coast and throughout the Caribbean is called Megalops atlanticus. And megalops just means large eye. And these guys have huge eyes. And if you've been out there chasing them and, you, and, you, and you're moving on some that are on a, they're travelers that are on a line, they're moving. And you got a fish out front. One of the things that's most spectacular to watch is that lead fish will lift its head out of the water while it's moving. And then you'll see that big eye turn and it'll look right at you. So these fish will lift their head out of the water and look at you. <laughs> and then oftentimes, if you've gotten too close and you spook them, they'll put the brakes on and they'll come right back up underneath the back end of your boat or the front end of your boat. And they'll get out into deeper water where you can't see them. And they'll move on down a ways. And before you know it, they'll get right back on that same line they were on, moving just the way they were before. But they're smart. They're instinctive. And that big eye serves a purpose. They, they, can, they can use that eye in ways that we can't. Um, the distribution you can see is all along the Gulf of Mexico. They'll run as far up as Newfoundland, all the way down through Central America, South America, and over here off the coast of Africa and throughout the Caribbean. So they've got a sort of tropical, semi-tropical distribution. Just to give you some idea, I mean, of course, we've been fishing them here in Florida probably before the 1800s when um, we began to populate the peninsula and fish for these guys with rods. I'm sure the indigenous populations were fishing for them as well. We don't eat them. They're really bony fish. But there are other um, countries and other peoples that actually have a uh, subsistence fishery, and they, they eat tarpon. But there's only two species of tarpon in the world. Atlanticus, which is the one that we fish for, and then there's one, Cyprinoides. And Cyprinoides is this one. It doesn't get very big, but it's a very similar, it's a species of tarpon. Some are just about 20 centimeters long, and this is in the Indo-Pacific. They're real small. They're like 20 centimeters. They're up in fresh water. And then if they're in, out in the same species, it's, if it's out in salt water, they can get up to about a meter, like three, a little over three feet or so. But there's another one out there. And if you look at the eye, the eye's a little bit different. They'll call this one an ox eye. So there's not just the one species, there's two. Um, the thing that really separates them out from other fishes in many different fishes is the fact that um, they have a way to consume oxygen at the surface. So they've got a, a swim bladder that functions a lot like a lung. It has tissues that can take that air. And in the past, we thought uh, these fish are just sometimes using that and they don't have to use it. But now, with the, in certain stages of their life, they're obligate. They have to gulp air from the surface. So you can find them in fresh water, stagnant, no oxygen whatsoever. They can survive it. Or you can find them out in open ocean water, um, full, sea, full, full sea water, full salt strength. Um, but they like bays, estuaries, mangrove lined lagoons. Um, they really like warmer temperatures. Um, Though the depths, they'll extend further, but typically down to about 98 feet is what we know. They can actually handle like hypersaline, super salty, you know, more than full strength seawater. So you get up into some of these lagoons where the salt concentration is like up to 47 parts per thousand. And they can, they can handle it. They can manage that. So they're tough. 
They, they can handle a lot more than a lot of other fishes. They're just not that sensitive. And there's another paper that was just out. We, you know, I, I get concerned a little bit about red tide and algal toxins that we hear about down in Sarasota. You know, is that messing with the population? Is that preventing them from moving up here? You know, uh, on given their uh, migratory routes and, and, and is that interfering with the timing of that? And these fish do, are susceptible to red tide and the toxins they produce, but they tend to be a little more uh, tolerant of it than other fish, at least according to the most recent study that I've read that's out there. Um, we all know what a tarpon looks like. They have huge scales. They can have different coloration on the back, just basically depending on where they've been. If they've been up inside of a, you know, a, a organically stained um, embayment, or uh, we even had juvenile tarpon recently up inside the coastal dune lakes. And we had a big freeze. The freeze killed them off. But their coloration will change based upon the kind of habitat and the water quality or water color that they've been in. Um, and again, the most unique thing about them is that modified swim bladder. And that bladder is um, a, a really uh, unique and interesting thing that they have that allows them to move into habitats that other fishes can't exploit. They can't get in there because they, you know, they, they can't breathe atmospheric oxygen. Um, their teeth, they have very unique, interesting mouth. They're, they're, they've got a huge mouth, like the size of a five gallon bucket is the way most of us describe it. Um, they've got very small teeth and They've got a plate that's in there that they can use for crushing crabs and other uh, prey items. And when you stick your hand in there, if you ever get the opportunity to do it by catching one, you want to describe that? Uh, well, you know, I mean, you, you leave scuffed up, but you're supposed to. That's, <laughs> that's what you brag about later. <laughs> you know, it, 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 normally doesn't, it normally doesn't bang you up to the point where, where it breaks the skin, but yeah. You, you, normally in the excitement, if you get the opportunity, either with a guide or by yourself, to reach down and grab one, you, you're, you're going to come away with some abrasion, but, you know, that, that just, that, that's what you get to show everybody later. But they don't have big spiky teeth. No, know? no. They have small stuff. and It's, it's like super, uh, super coarse sandpaper. Yep. So... Um, the females are usually bigger than the males, and the females can get up to over eight feet, and they get up to weights of about 355 pounds that we know of. Males are smaller. Um, they're a slow-growing fish, so, and they don't reach sexual maturity and, and the ability to spawn until they're about six or seven years old, and they get to a length of about four feet long. Um, for example, if you get a tarpon that's about 100 pounds, that fish is probably between 13 and 16 years old. And um, they can get a, you know, a lifespan of uh, over 30 years. And there was one in captivity actually up in Chicago at the John Shedd Aquarium that um, reached an age of uh, 63 years old. But they can live a lot longer in captivity than they can in the wild. Other than swim bladder, the thing that's most interesting about these fish is that they're more closely related to an eel. They look like a big giant sardine, but they're not related to sardines at all. They're actually related to eels. And the reason we know this is if you look at the larvae, and this is a tarpon larvae, it's called leptocephalus. And this is how it, it, it changes over time and they, spawn, they move offshore, they spawn offshore. I'll talk more about that in a minute, but they look, when they're first born, just like an eel. And if I look at, let's get it over here. Here you go, in this slide. And this is a tarpon larvae, and all this down here that you see, including this one right here, these are all eel larvae. So you can see they look very similar. So they're more closely related to an eel than they are to a sardine, even though in their adult stage they look more like a sardine. <clears throat> they 
They eat just about anything, and it changes over time as they grow out. Um, everything from zooplankton and insects to small fish, even those Indo-Pacific tarpon, they eat plants sometimes. Not that often, but they do it. And, um, and as they mature, they end up eating larger shrimp and crabs and, and fish. But, you know, I think at least in terms of the areas that we find them um, in the past, the recent past, where they congregate, they really like crab. Just like cobia, they love crustaceans. And um, any comments on that one? No, I think you're 100% <laughs> correct. <laughs> <laughs> so reproduction, again, sexual fecundity, it means they're ready to, to produce, and they're about six feet long. They can produce 12 million eggs. They can really produce a lot of eggs. But, and they usually do that in the months of May, June, and July. And that just happens to correspond with the months when we're out there after them. Another reason you don't want to kill them. Another reason you don't want to injure them. You know, if you're hooked into a big female, the last thing you want to do is kill that fish when that fish is ready, is ready to reproduce. And what they do is, on full and new moons, and I'm going to show you the data that supports this, they will move offshore and get into deeper water, and then they make deep dives, and, when they, and they typically do it at night when there's cover of darkness, and they use hydrostatic pressure that squeezes them, and it squeezes, we call it gamete, gametes, but it's squeezing the egg and the sperm out of them, and it's mixing naturally in the water column, and then as that egg hatches basically and grows out, and you get this, you'll get a plankton-type eel-looking organism and it tends to float to the surface. And then those larvae tend to feed on what we call as marine snow. It's plankton and other things that are tending to fall out of the water column. And then they evolve and they grow from there. But they're using, it's really interesting because, and it, it, it's not the only fish that does it. Um, bluefin tuna do it. Bonefish do it. They use hydrostatic pressure to squeeze that body as they dive to release egg and sperm. Comments? Nope. Okay. We, we are out of my realm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's why we make a good team. <laughs> so, uh, Bo's been fishing tarpon on fly a lot longer than I have. I've been fishing tarpon, the biggest tarpon and in, in one of the earliest tarpon I think I ever put on a, a, a line was a hand line down in Belize years and years ago out in the, the mangroves with a, with a friend of mine that lived down there. We used to go out of uh, Louisiana and catch him on the rigs all the time. Um, but catching him on a fly rod is, 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 to me, is the pinnacle. But, you know, understanding the fish and its life history and its requirements and what's needed is, is really important if we're going to protect it and keep that fishery in place, you know, like we enjoy it now and have in the past. And here's one way you can get involved with that. We talked about this before. You talked about it a lot, Bo. So how do you get involved? How do you help? You uh, can actually send off, and I've got the information right here. You can email them or call them. You can get just a small kit. You can clip a, just a little piece of the fin. Instead of killing these fish and ripping their guts out to find out what they're eating, they can actually do isotope analysis and they can get a better idea of what these fish are eating and when. And you can help out by calling in, getting a, a kit, and even if you're just going out with a guide, let him know you got the kit before you go out. Say, hey, if we get one, let's do this. Let's be prepared to get a little clipping and send this in. Even better, make sure you hire guides that have this. No. Yep. No, support guides that are supporting the fishery. All right. So predators, you can see here, we got a half-eaten big tarpon right there on the top. This guy's in a kayak, and there's a film of him uh, online. And he's just playing this fish for days. He's just taken way too long. And, and he was shocked. He had, you could tell he had no idea. And all of a sudden, while he's still playing the fish, this fish is so tired now that it was, uh, I think it was a bull shark that came in and just 
took him, right? In very shallow water, too. He wasn't in very deep water. So um, you just want to get that fish in as quickly as you can because the shark's going to get him. You know, once, once you've been successful, right, you've, you've done this impossible thing. You've convinced this, you know, this dinosaur to eat this compilation of probably poorly tied together fur and feathers. Once you do that, get in the game, man. I mean it. Fight them like you mean it. Everybody who says be gentle have never fought fish. You know, look at Steve Huff's book. Look at Billy Page's book. Every minute you fight that fish is a minute at risk. Every minute you cut off is a minute you win. I'm, I, you know, I, I'm, and set yourself some angler parameters. You know, be grown up about it. Go, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop at 20. I'm going to stop at, at, at 25 minutes. You know, if, you're, if, if your line's in the 40 minutes, then, then let's talk outside and let me help you find some fish fighting techniques to cut that down. Because, yeah. I mean, cause, I mean, I, I, I mean I, I, my guide clocked me this year. I put 125-pound fish. That I did this this year to this leg. I had 11 minutes with a fly rod. Chase him. Crank the motor. Be, be a steward. You're gonna, yeah. As long as he invites me back, you're going to hear this. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you to set parameters for yourself. Be a good angler. Don't just be a fisherman. Yeah. You know, I mean, don't don't sit and fight a fish until this. And again, this guy, this guy's not guilty. He didn't understand. Right. That's that's not that's not what we're using here. We're using this guy as an example. But the example here is he's in a kayak. He's using conventional tackle. The fish is dragging him around. He doesn't have the ability to change the game. He doesn't have the ability to fight him from the standing position. Use the rod correctly. Fight against the current. Fight against the turn. Use his legs. I mean, you know, if you're going to be a fly fisherman, we expect more out of y'all. We are the guys who know what to do. So be that guy. Know how to every time a fish makes a hedge an inch that way, I'm two inches this way. And I'm down here and I'm, and I'm grinding. I mean, you know, a good example is a very good friend of mine from Texas showed up this year and fished with us. And the first fish that he had a chance of boating, he, he let up on. And in unison, the guide and myself <laughs> yelled, you have to, in a string of expletives, reel. In unison. I mean, it sounded like a choir. Because, you know, I mean, and, and the guide finally looked at him and said, hey, man, you can do whatever you want, but you got 10 more minutes. <laughs> so when the, and so we, we all know now that these fish like to use atmospheric oxygen. They want to come to the surface and get a gulp, and that gives them... That oxygen gives them more energy, right? So what do we not want to do? Don't let up. Don't let up. Don't let the fish gulp. Hold him down. Keep him under the water. He wants to come up. Put the rod tip him. in the water. Yeah, put the rod tip in the water. You fight him, him, you hold him in the water. Everything. Yep. There should never be an easy moment for either of y'all during a fight. All right. If you're resting, he's resting. That's it. Yeah, stay in the game. Be dedicated. I know it's hot. I know all those things. But if you set parameters for yourself and say, okay, at 30 minutes, that's, my, that's it. And I'm going to tell you as a fly angler using the boat with a partner, that, that should be the maximum time you ever fight a fish. And at 30 minutes, break him off. Do it once. You'll get motivated. Next fish, you'll be in the game. You know, let, let a fish you know's hook good go. Try it. Because these are, these are fish of a lifetime for most anglers every time you jump one. So if you're going to use, if you're going to use your A game, this is the moment to use it and, you know, and, and be the beast, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I mean, use, use your legs, use your body, use your shoulders, use everything it takes. Because, you know, like I said, this, for him, it is literally like going 12 rounds with Mike Tyson with you, and then at the <laughs> end of it, while you take a picture, you're asking him to hold his breath for a minute. <laughs> so, I mean, imagine doing that. It's hard on this fish, and when you let him go, what we want him to do is not go over here and become food for something else. <laughs> All right, so continuing on with the biology here, you, you, in, unless you're a nerdy biology-interested person like myself, you may not care that much about parasites, but there's some that are pretty specific to tarpon. Um, and you can dig into this if you like, but, or give me a ring, I can tell you more about it if you're interested. But I always like to tell you as much as I can about the biology of the fish and the parasites are there. Um, 
and some of them are, are pretty interesting. There's a life cycle given to what the, you know, between the fish and what the fish is actually feeding on. And um, there's different stages for these different parasites that ultimately end up in the tarpon. But you can, you can ask me about more about that later if you like. But I want to tell you about some recent studies, and we're getting close to the end here. We're getting ready to wrap this up, and I'm going to get through this pretty quick. But one of the most interesting studies, and it's a recent one, it's published in 2019. This is probably the best data that we have on both the distribution, the migration, and the reproduction of tarpon that exists. From 2001 through 2018, there was 292 um, satellite telemetry tags that were deployed. And those were deployed through people like Bo and other, other guides that are out there. And Mostly by guides who work a lot more than I do. Yeah. <laughs> so they're actually out there and they're, they're helping to tag these fish. And, you know, getting this documented, because before this study, we really, we had an idea and just basically from observations from guys out there fishing for them all the time. But we didn't really have, you know, all the data in between the sightings. Now we do. We're, we're starting to collect that now. And, and given the improvements in technology and satellite telemetry, we're able to do it. So some of the things that came out, and, and the other thing I want to tell you is, is that tarpon, to date, there's no formal stock assessment. NOAA doesn't do it. Uh, Fish and Wildlife doesn't do it. State of Florida doesn't do it. We do not have a formal assessment of the stock of tarpon that are out there, and we don't have any regional fishery management plans either for tarpon. I think we're moving towards that, and this kind of data helps, I think, support the, the, the need for that as well. Because these fish, you know, they, we've learned that they make long seasonal migrations, and they do it over thousands of kilometers. And they cross all kinds of state, you know, and juridis, uh, jurisdictional borders. We've kind of known that intuitively, um, but now we really have the data to support it. Um, also, you know, you got fish that are, are just, they're local fish. They don't move around much. And then we've got fish that actually will move thousands of kilometers. You got, there's, there's, it's one or the other. They're moving around or they're sticking around. Um, and the tag data supports that as well. And then really what's, I think, the most interesting thing to come out of these studies is that now we have a really good idea of where their potential spawning grounds are. And we're learning that down the keys too, like with bonefish, permit, permit's a great, Example, there's a place you go down the Keys and there's a specific area where they know the time of the year and the place where they go to spawn. So they're able to protect them. You know, we're, we're going to, we're, we're learning that that's probably going to be true for, for tarpon as well. And I'm going to show you the maps. And then even with catch and release, we're learning too that shark predation and mortality after a catch and release is a lot higher than what was initially thought. So even when we're doing our best and we're taking care of the fish and we're, you know, we're catching release, you know, these fish are still tired if we're, if we're not working them hard enough and fast enough like we've been talking about to where they're still susceptible to predation by, you know, sharks that are lurking in the area. So this just, this might be a little bit hard to see, but the red dots is where the, these fish were tagged all in and around. And the white dots is where these telemetry tags uh, actually popped off or were released. And um, these tags weren't just telling us where the fish were, but these tags are telling us uh, it was measuring light, it was measuring temperature, it was measuring depth, and it was giving lat long the, the actual location. A lot of these tags, when they were found, actually had uh, te teeth marks, sharp marks all over them. <clears throat> this gives you a little idea of the, the movements in general. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Florida green and Texas red, Veracruz, Mexico in the light blue, and then there's Mobile, Alabama in white. Green and turquoise tracks are May to September. The red and white tracks are September to late November. So basically, if it's cold, they're hanging south, it gets, it warms up. 
they're moving out, they're moving along the Gulf Coast, and they're moving up the Northeast Coast. This is the most interesting gr graphic of all because this is telling us where these guys are actually uh, reproducing. And there's several different sets of data that's in here. And there's data where they're actually collecting the plankton, and they, and they know they've got tarpon plankton uh, available. And they know from deep dives that these fish are making, and I'm going to show you the data on that. From those telemetry units, they know when, where, and how deep these things were diving and how often, and it's where they're reproducing. So you get an area down here off the Keys, you get an area out here off of Southwest Florida, you got an area right here, right where we are, and I, can, I know Bo can tell you, you get a full or new moon, they're moving, aren't they, Bo? Yeah, they might. <laughs> I, I may or may not have gotten to full, fish the full moon in June for six days. So. Yeah. And, and, it, it, and they were active. We get an area here right off the mouth of the Mississippi River. And then we get movement. And we got another area over here in uh, Texas and one, and a really important one down here in Veracruz, Mexico. So we're just now getting the data that's showing us where they're going to reproduce. And when you think about it, we're thinking about these big uh, fish that are moving and laying up and traveling, and they're out there in <laughs> a lot of water. And now we have a really good understanding of where they're going and where they're reproducing, which in the past, that was a pretty difficult thing to, to know. Has anybody here seen fish way offshore? When you, when, when, did I, how far? I've seen them here before. Yeah, okay. And when it was, it was a big, very concentrated. Big, big, big wide. And moving, 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 moving. So they were moving, not chaining. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they were I, I have gotten to see that same thing once or twice, and it's, it always catches me off guard. And in fact, the first time I saw it, I thought it was tuna. Because yeah. now they weren't swirling, they were chaining, they were moving. And, but there, there, were just, there were so many, I mean, there, there was enough volume of fish that them breaking the water from a distance looked like tuna breaking the water on back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> really? That, that's yeah. what I—that's what I was after. Yeah. Was that. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I've never seen a wad that big, but I—but I've seen a wad that that was well over anything I've seen near, near the beach front. Yeah, because because when they're gone off the coast, they're gone. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. There's not they're like, either deep gone. Not, or deep. Most of them are gone, or some of them are gone. They're either here or they're gone. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I, I, I found fish under the full moon, but they, they're different. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and, and like John said, you know, if, you, if you're sitting in a spot where you keep getting turned down all the time, consider whether or whether or not you're seeing the same fish over and over and over again. Because <laughs> fish will lap boats. I mean, it's, it, it's not uncommon. You know, we, we have this mindset where we think these fish have this destination, and that's where they left the keys and they're headed to. Well, that's not true. They're they're going to get there, but they're going to do all kinds of things along the way. And so, if you start seeing the same size fish over and over again, you're probably seeing a fish that's just making a laugh. And, and if you spooked him the first time, he's you know he's done. <laughs> you you can spend the rest of the day giving him the best cash you got, but he's already decided this deal's over. Yeah, so for these reproducing fish, if we sort through all the data that's been collected over all those years, they like to be pretty close to a continental slope, right, where they can get to deep water. And they want a depth range of somewhere between 100 and 200 meters. You just multiply by about three to get that in feet. And then they're looking at temperatures uh, at somewhere around 26 degrees Celsius and a salinity of 36. So that's just full strength seawater. Um, they want to be within about 24 hours of travel distance from inshore coastal habitats. So they don't want to go way, way off there, but they, they want to be able to get offshore and to get deep, and, but they want to be close, they want to keep that as close as they possibly can 
back to the coastal shelf where they can feed. Well, that speaks to what he said, the fish that you saw coming back. I mean, it's, you know, when, when you think about where the continental shelf is here, it's 42, you know, yeah. the, the, out of Destin to the nipple. Yeah, so, and they, and they were trying to make their round trip, so they were greyhounding up. Yeah, so you're probably, Yeah. You're probably looking at these fish that ran off the spawn were coming back. Yeah. Okay. And with the density they're showing in that map, it does not surprise me that you saw a wad that was, you know, the size of a football field. Yeah. <laughs> this is really interesting just to show you the data. We don't have to go through this in detail, but each time you see a big jump like this or here and here is where they're making the deep dives, and we're measuring that now for some of these fish. And what's interesting too is, they don't just go out and spawn once. They, they, can, they can spawn multiple times over the course of a season too. So it's not just a one-time deal. You know, and, it, it, and there's a lot of terminologies for these, these things that you'll learn over the course of your life as a fly fisherman, and I'll let you have that journey on your own. But one thing I will say, as a young angler, I had, I, I had this destination thing in mind. You know, I thought migrators came past the beach like this. That's how they went. Well, that's not true. They, they zig in and out under the moons and the pressures, and they hit the beach, and they scatter. They go in all directions. So, so you, have to, you have to be a lot more nimble in the way you think than, than fish start here and go there. Because on any given day, they may be crashing in and going, you know, the opposite of the way they should. They can be in deeper or shallower water. You know, it, you know, never ever, don't ever underestimate a Hail Mary. I've made a lot of them work in my life. <laughs> you, right. know, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have, have caught fish in a couple of different places that, that, that I thought were oddities. And, and now as we've tracked them over the course of a decade, they're there every year. They're not there for long, and they're not there on the same day. They're, on, they're there in the same conditions. And so, you know, diagram what you're doing. Keep track of what the moon phase is, your tides. That's why captains keep logs. It's so you can look yep. last year at this year. Here's some additional data off of uh, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And you can see these fish moving up into Mobile Bay, but they typically move and they'll get around the Chandelier Islands. They'll get up here towards Lake Bourne. We know that some fish historically have moved all the way into Lake Pontchartrain. They don't as much anymore, but where they do accumulate is right out here, right in the mouth, off the mouth of the Mississippi River. And one of the, the ideas here is that, and you can see it here in the statistical analysis, they really like being out here. There's a low dissolved oxygen uh, event that happens there, especially in the summer when they're moving. And since they can breathe atmospheric oxygen, they can really take advantage of that habitat. It's super rich, it's high nutrient load, it's a lot of, a lot of uh, a prey there. And, and nothing else can breathe. And not much else can breathe there. <laughs> but so they've got it good right there. And if we look at one fish in particular, Here's one that Holly 2 caught, and they tagged it, and this is how we can all get involved and, and, and produce data that's gonna help. That fish was tagged right here, and they tracked that fish all the way over, came over here, went over towards Lake Bourne, came back to the Chandeliers, right on across. There's a canal here, probably came through the canal, and then it ended up right here off the mouth of the Mississippi River. Um, so that's just one particular fish that was tagged after a uh, fisherman caught it, Holly 2. I'm gonna leave it right there. Hopefully we didn't take too much time tonight. There's a lot of information. We're gonna do a part two on tarpon where we're gonna talk even more about just fishing tarpon. And we'll get Bo back if we can. And we've got another local guide that's too busy fishing just to talk this time of year. We'll get him back here in September. He's, so he's, we're going to do a part he's stuck two. with guys like me this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you, we're going to wrap it up right there. I really appreciate y'all coming out. It's not easy to come out this time of night and to stick around and 
listen to two guys yak about fishing, but there's a lot of really good information here that otherwise you're not going to really find it as much like in a fishing magazine or online. You're going to get both insight from someone like Bo and other guest speakers we're going to have for the seminar series. You get a little bit about the science and it's just a good mix and it's a unique set of information that you're available to get thanks to the guys here at Legendary that's promoting this. So thank you for coming.